Amen. Good morning, church. You know, those, the song lyrics are, are powerful. Hopefully they're more than just words to us this morning. Whether you're here or listening online, um, there may be things in your life where um, you're not real excited about it. You're not real happy with how it's turned out. Um, you're wrestling with, Lord, why have you allowed this into my life? Do you believe that he is faithful do you believe that he has a, a good plan and he is a good God? Right? May we not offer him empty words, but may they come from a heart that is believing these things about him. And I have to imagine on a day like today where we're in the Arctic tundra and people's plans have been changed, right? you need to be reminded of that truth. I need to be reminded of that truth. Did you know that this week uh, we have colder temperatures than Moscow, Russia, and Anchorage, Alaska? That is not a temperature record that I want to have. <laughs> you know, what is Iowa doing right now? Here we are. If you're new, um, welcome. Glad to have you here this morning. Glad you could make it. My name is Nick Lees, and I serve as a senior pastor. I have the privilege of opening up God's Word with you this morning. But before we do that, before we get into our text for the day, I want to ask you a question. You're going to hear it a few times in our sermon today, but here's the question. What have you been looking at this week? What have you been looking at this week? Last week, we heard Paul say that we are to uh, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, that we're to set our minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Is that where your gaze has been this week? Have you been focusing on Christ and on the things that are above, or... Have you been distracted by all sorts of other things that are clamoring for your time and your attention? And we know that there are many of those, aren't there? There are many distractions, many things in our world that say, I want your attention and I want it right now. Some of them are good and some of them are not so good. I'll just give you an example from my life. So in our home, it's a regular occurrence where I'll be doing something and I hear, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. What, honey? Daddy's talking with mommy or daddy's reading his Bible. Uh, can you wait? <laughs> okay, honey, what is it? Daddy, will you get me milk? <laughs> that's a near daily occurrence in our household. And, you know, that's a cute example, but there are a lot of different things that come up in our day-to-day lives that, that are distractions, that, that, that clamor for our attention. And for some of you, your phones never stop bzz, bzz, bzz. Or for those heathens that don't put it on vibrate, they're, they're ding, 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 you know, as, as text message after text message comes, or uh, notification after notification of social media comes, or whatever it is, right, that you have set up on your phone. Maybe for the students in the room, or the maybe even some of our adults, right, you're, you're feeling that pull, that desire to just to play uh, one more round of, of whatever the latest game is, Fortnite, or Call of Duty, or you name it. There's a lot of things that that call out for our attention, that call out for our affection. What are you looking at? Where has your gaze been? Does any of this resonate with you guys? Please tell me I'm not the only one who has all sorts of things like clamoring for my attention, right? I'm not alone in this, right? Okay, good, good. Uh, Nine o'clock agreed too. So we are on the same page. There's lots of things that can distract us. Where will our gaze be? Where will our attention be directed to? That's what we're going to be talking about in Colossians chapter 3 today. And we're going to be in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 this morning. And if you're, if you're paying attention, you might think, wait a minute. We just studied verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3 last week. Why is it coming up again? Well, I have news for you. Get real comfortable with these verses because we're going to have them not only last week and today, but for the next three Sundays. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, and those verses are going to be included in each one of the sermons because they are so important to what Paul is teaching in this letter. They are the bridge between what what Paul has said already, that Christ is supreme, he's central to our lives, and we're united to him. And now, what we're getting into in his letter, the call to live in light of that truth. And so, verses uh, 1 through 4 of chapter 3 are that bridge. And if you remember... Over the first two chapters, Paul has really been building up the supremacy of Christ and the superiority of Christ. That's why our our series is called Christ Is, 
Christ is greater. Christ is supreme. Christ is preeminent. Because he is the greatest one. He is God. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. And Paul also repeatedly hammered home, look, Colossians, you're united with Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. Because you have faith in him as your Messiah and your Lord, you're not dead in sin anymore. You are made new in Christ. You no longer have to live according to these man-made rules and regulations, but instead you have the privilege of obeying Jesus and his teachings. And up to this point, everything that Paul's been instructing them in has really been uh, in the negative in the sense of it's in response to what others are doing, the false teachers primarily. Let me, let me show you what he's already called them to. So we're going to go back to chapter 2, verse 6. There Paul says, look, walk in Christ. And right after that, there are three commands given, all of them in response to the false teachers. He says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. A little bit later in verse 16, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of, and then he lists off these things that they were teaching, the false teachers. And then two verses later in verse 18, he says, Let no one disqualify or, or to condemn you, insisting on, and again, he gives these regulations that the false teachers were teaching. We notice that all three of those are what not to allow into your life. They're responses to others who are trying to force certain kinds of teachings on you. What we're about to see as we get into chapter 3 a little more in detail today is Paul's going to change his way of teaching a bit. He's going to start focusing on some of the positive actions that the, the Colossians can take. Um, it's not so much about how they're responding to others anymore, but here's what you should be doing in response to who Christ is. Because he's supreme, now live this way. Because you've been made new, live this way. So go ahead, if you haven't yet, and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Um, that's page 572 of the Blue Bibles, if you grabbed one of those on your way in. And we're going to read Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11 today. So I'll give you a minute to get there, and then I'll read the text aloud for us. All right, here we go. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. Now Paul is, is pointing out to them, look, you have been made new in Christ. You have been transformed in Christ. You're no longer enslaved to sin. You're no longer dead in it. Your life now is hidden with Christ in God. If you were with us last week, uh, the way that we phrase that is, Christ is my life. Christ is my hope. And those have to be a whole lot more than just catchy phrases for us. Those are ways of living. They're convictions that we then live out day by day. Because I am made new, I live a certain way. You've been given a new humanity. So what does that mean? How do you live out this newness of life? How does it change you? Well, one thing's clear from verses 1 through 4. Christ is central to this new humanity. Christ is central to this new humanity, your new life. And so that's what I want to spend time talking with you about today, allowing the centrality of Christ to shape your life. 
allowing the centrality of Christ to shape your life. And let's define centrality. Centrality means the quality of being essential or of the greatest importance. The quality of being essential or of the greatest importance. So if we say it a different way, allowing the essentiality of Christ to shape your life. Or allowing Christ, who is of the greatest importance, to shape your life. I hope that begins to drive home what we're talking about this morning. Christ changes us. He transforms us because He is whom we live for. He is the most important thing to us. And the way we're going to summarize this is in two points. So I'm going to give them to you right now at the beginning of our time together so you can fill in those blanks and then we can focus on the details of how we actually live it out. So here's the first one. So look to Christ. Look to Christ. Then the second, live in light of Christ's finished work. Live in light of Christ's finished work. So look and live. And I have to confess to you this morning um, that I had some help in, in deciding on those two words. I do believe they're in the text. I do believe that the text supports them. Um, but it also came from a book that I'm reading right now uh, called Look and Live by that title. Um, it's an excellent resource that DJ actually um, brought to our staff's attention, and he bought us all copies of it. The subtitle of it is Behold the Soul-Thrilling, Sin-Destroying Glory of Christ. It's been an excellent book, and it's going to capture, uh, it captures a lot of the themes that we're talking about in Colossians 3 today, but the author, Matt Papa, actually expands upon it. He shows, like, this is not just Colossians 3. This is all over the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, show that as we look to Christ, as we behold Him, that changes everything. It changes everything about us. Now, I know I have a, a habit of, of recommending books quite a bit up here. Um, here's my promise to you. I will never recommend a book that is a waste of your time. So I may recommend a lot of books, but I will never recommend one that would be a waste of your time if you, if you took the time to buy it and read it. So do with that what you will. Uh, just put that out there. I assume you're already reading The Compelling Community. As a church, we're going through that this year. Um, so don't let this one come before that. But if you want another book, this is a good one. Anyways, let's go back to our study, back to the text. How can you allow the centrality of Jesus Christ to shape your life. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. There's two commands that Paul gives in verses 1 through 4 that, that give us this clear direction. First one, in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Right after that, in verse 2, Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Both of those commands give us the impression of, of we are pursuing something, we're set on something, it's leading us in a particular direction. In this case, it's pursuit of Christ. We're going to seek or look for or desire the things that are above where Christ is. We're going to set your mind on or think about, again, the things that are above. Those are specific actions that flow out of our unity with Christ. Because you are a new man or a new woman, you seek him. You look to him. You delight in him. You desire him. Set your mind on him. So here's the question again that we asked earlier. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? What are you desiring? What do you think about? something to consider. Scripture is very clear that the things that we set our eyes on, the things that we set our hearts on, that we behold, have a powerful effect on our lives. They, they change us. They begin to transform us. And I want to give you a couple of examples from the Old Testament of this in a positive way. The first is written by King David from Psalm 34. Here's what he says. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. So as David looks to the Lord, and as he calls others to look to the Lord, there's something happening. There's a transformation taking place. 
Let me show you from Exodus 34 what happens for Moses. It says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. And both of these men had very um, intimate relationships with God in the sense that they were drawing near to him. They were looking at him. They were able to fellowship with God and, and, and interact with him in a very amazing way. And what happens as they do that is God's glory begins to rub off on them. Right? They begin to reflect God's glory to the world around them. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's David and Moses. I mean, who am I in comparison to them? Well, think about the, this. Um, David and Moses were long before Christ. Right? They did not have the, the benefit of the full revelation of, of Jesus Christ, who is God in bodily form that we have. Let's consider that for a minute. As Paul's writing to the Colossians, he's already told them Jesus is the, the image of the invisible God. That he is the fullness of God in bodily form. And yes, they haven't seen him firsthand. The Colossians had not, but Paul has. And Paul's a messenger bringing the gospel to them, and he's declaring the glory of God, and they have the opportunity to sit under his teaching. We have the scriptures available to us, written, again, by firsthand eyewitnesses to the glory of Christ. We can be transformed by his glory. In fact, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians a little bit more about this transforming work. Let me share with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. He says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What you're hearing is that when you turn to Christ, when, when you turn to him as your Savior and Lord, this veil, our veil of sin, it is removed. What was previously keeping us from, from understanding the word and, and reflecting glory is now taken away through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first and most important looking to Christ that any one of us ever does. And that's a gift from God. It's a, it's a work of, of faith that God grants to us. But when that happens in your life, then we're told that the more you behold the glory of the Lord, the more that you are looking to him, what happens next? You're transformed by it. That glory begins to rub off on you. You begin to change. You begin to be conformed to the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. So what we're not talking about is a simple one-time action. Oh, I, I looked to Christ for faith, and, and I believed. I'm good. No, more than that. Beholding gives the, the impression of, I'm continuing to look. I'm continuing to consider. I'm continuing to contemplate the beauties of my Savior. My, my gaze is fixed on Him. And maybe it'd be helpful to just kind of bring this into maybe a real-world example. So think about this morning when you got up. Right. Part of your morning routine, I'm assuming, was that you went into your bathroom, and there you are standing before your mirror. Right? So you're beholding yourself in the mirror, and what happens next? Right? You start to you look around, and you're like, oh, scream maybe, yeah. That's at first, right? You're like, ah, my, my teeth are gross. I better brush them. Right? And then again, you're like, uh, I, don't, I don't think I got it all. Right? You might get out the floss, get out the, the water pick or whatever you use. Maybe for the men, you're like, oh, the beard's a little long. Maybe you need to trim it up a bit. It looks a little scraggly. For the ladies, oh, man, I, I want to put some makeup on. And that's no comment on your appearance. It's just I've observed my wife, and that's part of her morning routine. So I'm just assuming there. Right, but, you know, this analogy is not perfect. But what are you doing? You are beholding in the mirror your own image, and, and you are realizing there's some things that need to be transformed about it. And so that process begins. Now, it kind of breaks down from there, but hopefully at least it's helpful in beginning to get the point across. As you're beholding the glory of the Lord, what you're doing is you're taking time to consider him. You're taking time to contemplate him. You're thinking about God's glory, right? His magnificence, his sheer radiance, his worthiness of praise. And you're chewing on it. 
and you're thinking about, man, God, you're really good. All that you do is good. Who you are is good. You're worthy of worship. And that begins to change you. Right? As, you as you behold that, as you stare at that, as you think about that. So here's another question for you. How do you like to behold the glory of the Lord? How do you like to behold the glory of the Lord? I'll tell you, for me, um, one of the ways that I like to behold the glory of the Lord is in nature. I love getting out into his creation and seeing just the diversity of what he's made. And even on these cold, chilly winter weeks, I still enjoy from the warmth of my living room, looking out the back window and seeing the crisp white winter snow, punctuated by these beautiful green fir trees that we have in our backyard. And in the morning time, you know, as, I'm out, as I'm sitting on the couch reading the Bible, when that sunrise comes over the home behind us, it's just gorgeous. The colors that we see, I mean, I just love that. It leads me to worship. And then later in the evening when we're at the, uh, the dining room table, which just happens to be on the other side of the house, we get to see the sun set over the homes on the other side of our, of our house. And it's just beautiful. It leads me to worship. I mean, beholding God's glory right there. One of the uh, most favorite opportunities I had to behold God's glory in nature was a few years ago, Michaela and I got away. You can imagine we might need to do that from time to time. Um, we got away to Lake Tahoe. Uh, for a little R&R, and if you've never been there, it is gorgeous. I would encourage you to go. It's mountainous, beautiful trees. Uh, Lake Tahoe itself is like just a pane of glass. You can see down 70 feet, the water is so clear. It is just an absolute opportunity to worship the Lord and say, wow, God, what you've made is beautiful. And if you go out for, you know, a run through the woods, it will literally and figuratively take your breath away because it's beautiful, and also you're at 6,000 feet, and there's not a lot of oxygen to, to get in the lungs when you're running. But that was one of my favorite times to just go out and to behold the glory of the Lord. It provoked worship in me. I also like uh, to behold the glory of the Lord through the study of his word. Where else do we have the opportunity to read about our Savior? To, to be told firsthand eyewitness accounts of, of how he walked and how he lived his life. And every parable is an opportunity to, to sit at his feet and learn. Every interaction that he has with, with someone who's weak and weary is encouraging to our soul. It's a reminder that he cares for the brokenhearted sinner. Every zealous interaction with the Pharisees and the religious elite reminds us that he doesn't stand for people leading his children away from God. I love that. We can't get that anywhere else other than the Word. It's great to behold the glory of the Lord in His Word. It should provoke change in us. The other one uh, that comes to my mind, it's, it's relatively recent for me in my life. It's watching a TV show by the name of The Chosen. And, and yes, it's a man-made depiction of, of what could have happened back in, in the Middle East in the first century when Jesus was walking uh, the world. But I'll tell you what, um, it has led me to worship as I've been watching it. Because it has helped me, as we talk about you know, this stuff in Colossians and the, the deity of Christ, his supremacy, his, his power and majesty, to, to then see this show and say, oh my goodness, our creator, our sustainer came down. He walked among us. Here he is breaking bread with his disciples. There he is meeting Mary Magdalene and, and freeing her from demonic oppression. And it just drives home these beautiful concepts from Scripture. And I've been in tears multiple times because I'm just like, wow, Lord, you're amazing. You're worthy of praise. So what is it for you? What do you enjoy looking at? What helps you behold the glory of the Lord? Are you beholding his glory? Are you looking to Christ or something else? Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. And as you do that, as you behold God's glory, it will transform you. His glory will rub off on you. Your face will be radiant as you speak about the things of the Lord, as you live for the things of the Lord. You live in light of his glory. And that brings us to that second way to allow the centrality of Christ to shape your life. Live in light of Christ's finished work. Live in light 
of Christ's finished work. Look and live. Look and live. And the beautiful thing about the call to look to Christ um, is it's not staring at your spiritual belly button all day long. That's how my former senior pastor used to talk about it. It's like, you're not sitting around just staring off into space. I'm, I'm new in Christ. Great. I'm going to pontificate all these things and then never do anything with it. No, as you look to him, as his glory is rubbing off on you, it changes you. It transforms you. It's a call to then live in light of what he's done. And that's exactly what Paul does here. So he calls him to look to Christ. Now he shifts his attention in verses 5 through 11 about here's what it looks like to live it out. And we see three commands that are given in verses 5 through 11. We'll just walk through them one by one. The first command is in verse 5. It says, put to death what is earthly in you. Put to death what is earthly in you. And it's following, uh, there's a list of evil vices not to participate in. We'll come back to that in a minute. The second command is in verse 8. Pretty similar. It says, put them all away. Again, followed by a list of evil vices, evil things not to be partaking in. And then the last one is in verse 9, where it says, do not lie to one another. All three of those are real-world implications, real-world application of looking to Christ. As we behold Him, these things begin to play out in our life. It changes you. So let's talk through them. Verse 5 says, Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you. And I moved the word therefore to the front of the sentence because I think it helps us understand that's based on what came before. Because you are alive with Christ, because He's made you new, do these things. Put this to death. Put to death what's earthly in you. We talked a bit about that last week. Earthly means the things that are opposed to God. Put to death the things that are opposed to God in your life. Not that you check out of this world, not that you're not caring about what's happening around you, but that you're not participating in or allowing into your life the things that are directly opposed to God. Now, Paul says this in a particular way that's very important. And we miss this in our English translations. But what he does here is as he moves into these commands, he changes his tenses in the verbs. And so what he's doing, and I'm going to put it on the screen behind us, is he's introducing that there's this initial decisive act which then introduces a settled attitude in us. There's an uh, initial decisive act which introduces a settled attitude within us. And I'm going to walk you through this. So here's the initial decisive act. It's this, because you died with Christ and you're now raised with him, the sinful nature is put to death in you. That's, a, that's a, something that happens at a point in time in your life. Christ is the one who's done it. And Paul's been very clear about that to the Colossians. God rescues you out of darkness and transfers you to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's a decisive initial act that occurs in a Christian's life when you're rescued and redeemed. Your sinful nature is put to death. But that also then leads to a settled attitude that you're to have. Based on what Christ has done in me, now I will live in light of this new reality. That's my settled attitude. Christ has done this. He's produced this in me. Now I'm going to allow it to change my life. I'm going to live in light of it. I appreciate how David Powell puts it in his commentary. He says, this call means let the old man who's already died in baptism be dead. Let the old man who's already died in baptism be dead. And then he goes on to say, to put to death means to live with a recognition that one is already freed from the power of sin. It's a reality for you. If you're in Christ, you are no longer enslaved to sin. You are set free from it. And now you're called to live in light of it. Right, so be dead to sexual immorality and impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul's saying those types of desires, those types of actions, should not characterize a Christian. <laughs> Maybe you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, well, uh, what world do you live in, Nick? Because uh, that's easier said than done. The world that I live in is full of those kind of temptations. I have to fight with those things regularly. And that's a fair point, right? Uh, there's a reason why Paul includes it in his letter to the Colossians. 
Because ever since Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, humanity has struggled with these things. We've misused and abused uh, godly sexuality and intimacy. Contentment has been corrupted for us. He writes about these things because this is the reality that we live in. And it's become easy for us, and, and perhaps we could even say natural for us, to pursue our own selfish, twisted desires. We begin to misuse and abuse God's beautiful plan. And what I thought we would do, instead of you know, going through like this laundry list of ways that we could pursue those things, those negative things, is instead we would spend our time talking about, okay, well, what does it look like to live in light of Christ's finished work? If that's what Paul's aiming for, then what does that look like? And here's what we need to be thinking about. Because Christ has shed his blood for our redemption, because you have responded to him in faith, because he's now made you new and he's, he's freed you from enslavement to sin, because those things are true, we put these sinful tendencies, these sinful temptations to death. We're living in light of this reality. And the way that that happens primarily is by looking to Christ, by, by having our gaze set on Christ, our desires set on Christ. It's as you behold the glory of the Lord that you worship Him in your day-to-day living. Your affections and your attentions, they're, they're not taken to these other things. They're drawn back to the Lord. Have you ever met anybody who is so singularly focused on a task that nothing can derail them from it? Nothing will take their attention or their time away from it? The staff and I were were talking about that on Tuesday morning in our staff meeting, and one of the examples that came up in that discussion was, you know, the the point guard who's on the free throw line. The game time clock has expired, but he got fouled at the last minute. Score's tied up. He's got two shots, right? Two opportunities to win the game for his team. Where is that point guard's focus in that moment? On the hoop, right? What's the crowd doing behind him, behind the hoop? Right? They're like, whoa, miss it! You know, they're making all sorts of noise and waving and stuff. Is Is he looking at them? Is he paying attention to them? No. Zeroed in on the hoop, right? He's not thinking about the crowd. He's not thinking about the scoreboard. He's not thinking about the the opponents that are around him, waiting, hoping that he'll miss both shots. He's singular in focus in mind. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about beholding Christ, that that Christ would consume our attention and our focus to the degree uh, that, that we're not distracted by other things, that we are pursuing him regularly through his word and prayer, through confession of sin and and being reconciled to our loved ones, even through corporate worship here, things like that, fellowship with other Christians, that as we do these things, that's just keeping our eyes and our gaze on Christ. It's not that we're disconnected from the world around us. It's not that we're not going to uh, face temptations or trials. I'm not saying that. But in the midst of all of that, our focus, our, our primary love is Christ which then leads us to respond so much differently when those temptations and distractions come up. Who wants a burger from White Castle when you've just had a steak at Fleming's? Right? No one's making that trade. If you're full on a delicious $100 steak and someone walks up to you and is like, hey, you want this White Castle burger? You're not saying yes. No, I'm full on Christ. I don't need that garbage. That's the point. Paul goes on to to give a second list of sins in verse 8. He says, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, seen talk from your mouth. And then he tacks one more on in verse 9. Do not lie to one another. There's a theme there. It has to do with your speech. He's saying don't don't use your tongue for evil. Don't, Don't use your words to tear others down, to hurt them. Instead, use them for good. And the other sins... Well, they have to do with your anger. Don't be sinful in your anger. Don't be given to sinful outbursts of anger. Paul says, look, those sins, they used to define you before Christ. 
You used to walk in those ways. You used to live in them, but no more. Not in Jesus, not if you've been made new in him. They used to invite God's wrath into your life. And for those that are still living in them and outside of Christ, they are still inviting God's wrath into their lives. But not if you're in Christ, not if you're walking with him. Live in light of Christ's finished work. Look and live. That's what Paul's telling us to do. And Paul goes on to use a fascinating analogy in these last couple of verses here, in verses 9 through 11. He kind of plays out the analogy in 9 and 10 and then talks about the the outcome of it in verse 11. He says that you're to put off the old self with its practices and replace it with the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. The way he's speaking is, is akin to like putting on and taking off clothes. You see, take off the old set of clothes, put them aside, and you put on a new set of clothes. We understand that with clothing, but what in the world does that mean with identity? How do we just take off our old identity and set it aside and and put on a new identity? Let me try to flesh this out a little bit. If you think about clothing, it has a specific role in our world. It is often associated with your station in life or your identity. You can tell uh, whether a person is male or female by their clothing. You can often tell whether they're young or old by their clothing. You can tell whether they're wealthy or poor by their clothing. You can tell uh, one person is a prisoner and one person is a judge because they're wearing different clothing. Or whether one person considers themselves an athlete and maybe another is an academic. And this is not a, a statement about whether that's right or wrong or anything like that. It's just the way it is. Clothing identifies us. It's a way of knowing where people are at. Well, how does that relate to our identity? When you become a Christian, your clothing changes. Your identity changes. You put off the old identity, the one that was enslaved by sin, that was living for uh, whatever selfish pursuits that you wanted, and you exchange that for a new identity of, of enslavement to righteousness of being made new in Christ. You have a new humanity. And ultimately, God is the one who does that for you. God is the one who makes you new. He's the one who does this, and you live in light of it. As you're clothed in this new humanity, now you are free to live for Christ, to look and live. You can understand the Scriptures. You can begin to live in light of them. Because he empowers you to do so. Your desires and your behaviors, they begin to change in accord with that new identity. As you learn about your creator, you become transformed from one degree of glory to another. That's the work of God in you. Maybe you'd say, well, but if I'm made new, then why do I still struggle with sin? Why is that still part of my life if I am made new, if I have a new identity? Well, that's a fair question. Again, Paul has included this in Colossians for a reason. They still live in a broken, sinful world. And yeah, you're not defined by that old man or old woman anymore. You've put that off. But guess what? Temptations still abound. Sin is still present in our world. And and it's a daily war to choose what's right. Paul knows that these Colossians have profess faith in Christ. He celebrated that at the beginning of his letter. But he also knows they need to learn how to live in light of that newness in Christ. So he's equipping them. He's teaching them. He's helping them to understand, look, there is joy that comes from saying, no, I don't want that way anymore. I'm not going back down that path. And yes, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to choose the things that please you. To learn to delight in the ways of the Lord. That's what he's encouraging them towards. And so as we're thinking about that this morning, if you're here today and you're, you're struggling to delight in godliness, you're struggling to delight in the ways of the Lord, you ought to be concerned about that. That would indicate that possibly you've hardened your heart to the Lord. Typically that happens through failing to confess and turn away from sin in a timely manner. We are called as Christians to be quick to address our sin, to be quick to turn away from it 
confess and ask forgiveness. And when we don't do that, it does not end well. So you can go back to the Old Testament. You can look at the examples of Pharaoh and Samson and see um, for both of those men, very different scenarios, but similar in the fact that they were living very selfishly, unrepentantly. It did not end well for them. I want to encourage you, if you're here and that's your situation, don't keep on that path. Don't waste your life in pursuit of sin. Now, on the other hand, um, you may be struggling to delight in, in the Lord and, and these things, but not because your heart's hard, but rather because you feel overwhelmed. Uh, it's possible that you're locked in a spiritual war and you need help. Or you're trying with all your might to choose the things that please the Lord, but it's, it seems like you're not making progress. Maybe that's how you feel today. The good news is God has designed this pursuit to be corporate as well as personal. We have to remember that this letter is written to a group of Christians, right? It's written to the church at Colossae. And so they are supposed to receive this as a corporate entity. These uh, sins that he lays out here are ones that are often done in relationship with other people. They, they require community. And so the growing and the repentance and the granting of forgiveness, that happens in that same community. The process of being made new and of pursuing holiness is a corporate concern as well as a personal pursuit. It's a corporate concern as well as a personal pursuit. So as you think about that, living in light of Christ's finished work means learning to let others in, being willing to ask for help, to be willing to say, I am hurting, I am struggling, please help me. And it may mean that you need to confess sin. It may mean that you need to confront sin. But what you need to do is to be willing to share, to be willing to go through life together with others. If you're the one who sinned, be willing to ask for forgiveness. Be willing to confess where you're guilty. And if you're the one who's been sinned against, be willing to grant forgiveness. Be willing to come alongside of them and walk with them. That's the beauty of Christian relationships. That's how God has designed it. We have been forgiven much, so we are quick to forgive. And when the church operates that way, it's a beautiful testimony. Right? We are becoming the compelling community that he's called us to be. And it will stand out in our world. Now, Paul ends this section in verse 11 by specifically emphasizing the unity that we have in Christ. In Christ, we are on equal ground. And so there's no reason to treat others differently based on their race or their cultural differences or social standing or ceremonial observations. Those things are not what brings us together, and they shouldn't be what keeps us apart. Christ is our unity. Christ is the one who's made us new. And how wonderful would it be if our church operated this way? Right? If not just our church, but God's church operated this way, that we would reflect the community that's around us. That's my desire for our church, that we would be a place that's so welcoming that when people come in from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, different races, different cultural um, perspectives, that they would feel welcomed here and loved here because what holds us together is Christ. And they would be comfortable saying, you know what? I want to stick around. I want to see what these people are about. I want to learn more about Christ at this church. What a sweet celebration of unity that would be.